Welcome to the Pin Leader Podcast, where strategic leaders get straight to the topics, strengthening our awareness and sharpening our minds. The Pin Leader Podcast is produced by Roar, a production division of Maze and Associates LTD. Find out more at www.mazeassociatesltd.com. Now here is your award-winning host, Dr. Shan DeGore. And welcome back to the Pin Leader Podcast. Today, we're going to be talking about a hole in one idea. So for my golfing friends out there, you'll know what I'm talking about. And of course, we're going to be talking about leadership along with that. But I am excited to have with me today, Miss Meg Resner, who is the principal of Meg Resner and Associates. Uh, she has been a wonderful advocate for golf, uh, not only in the local area, but also internationally. Her consulting practice specializes in optimizing organizational performance, and we'll hear a little bit more about that. She's held several positions, one of them being a vice president for human resources, but she works again across the board with a number of her businesses and in, in coaching and strategic planning. Uh, she earned her undergraduate degree in marketing from the University of Rhode Island in she has been a co-chair for the 2021 Solheim Cup. So for those that are listening overseas, you may have heard of the Solheim Cup. Uh, she likes to make a difference in the community. She commits her time, her talent. She's been involved in so many foundations. She's previously served on the Owens Corning Foundation. She's been on the board of David's House Compassion, the Arts Commission Board, the chair of the Women's Initiative of United Way. She's been the president of the ProMedica Metro Foundation Board, the chair of the Avenues for Autism Board. And she also is part uh, and chairs the Women's Leadership Summit, which we will be talking about. Um, and that's involved in the LPGA tournament in Toledo. She is the board chair for the MA Culture Building Institute. And she's recently joined the, the Tyner Foundation Board and the Greater Toledo Foundation Board, and she serves as for Development and Equity and Access Committees. So welcome aboard, and thank you for joining us on the show, Meg Resner. Hi, Shanda. Thank you so much for having me. I'm really excited to be here. Yes. So I had uh, I read off the number of the boards in your community service and so much you get back, but what are you passionate about? Well, I'm passionate about a few things. Um, I'm passionate about family. I'm passionate about community. And um, and as you heard in the bio, I'm, I just am really committed to making a difference where I can. Mm -hmm. Out of all of those boards, you, you know, talk to me a little bit about your accomplishments. I mean, what would you say is your major accomplishment? Well, that's a big question. I think the 21 Solheim Cup was obviously a huge accomplishment to be in that role in something that had such a impact in Toledo as as well as you know just being involved in sort of the global presence of the Solheim Cup and and how Toledo showed up in such a powerful way it was really fun to be a part of that the avenues for autism board is something i'm incredibly proud of i have an autistic brother my mom was just an amazing advocate for him and carrying on her legacy is extremely important to me and i'm able to do that on the Tyner Foundation board which is one of the primary funders for Avenues for Autism. So I stay very well connected to autism work and, and lifting up our community to support those with autism. And one thing that I've always admired about your work is that you tie in not only what you do day to day, but also that compassionate role that give back to the community. And you just mentioned family. You know, you've done this also tied it in with golf, which is, which is another passion of yours. She's a great golfer if anybody's ever <laughs> golfed with her. But can you talk a little bit about that and how you've been able to tie that, you know, to help support the community? So golf has just been an incredibly important part of my life for a very long time. And it started when I was in sales back in Chicago in my 20s. And there were three of us, three women on the team, and none of us played golf. And our boss said, everybody plays golf, customer golf. We'll go to sales meetings. The R&R &R will be golf. And if you don't learn to play and get comfortable on the golf course, you're going to be left out. And thankfully, he took us under his wing and he didn't really teach us the technique of golf, but he taught us how to navigate the golf course and how to play with people from all different levels, which is one of the most, I think, 
great things about golf is that regardless of the level of play, you can play with anyone as long as you are self-aware and kind of know the principles of keeping pace and um, and paying attention to you know what's going on around you. Mm-hmm. And I think that you're on that international scene of Solheim that you mentioned. You know, there was also some great benefit. I mean, there were hundreds of thousands of people that descended to watch individuals play golf. And people say, well, what's that look like? It was an amazing time. And you really spurred a number of activities and dialogues away from that. Is that right? Yeah. So I think that a lot of times golf is seen as a sport that's primarily for rich and affluent people. And a lot of people don't necessarily see their connection to golf. And so I think that's what we tried to do with the Solheim Cup is open that door for everyone. So we had an organization called Women for Solheim, and we really tried to engage uh, women and black women and Latino women, women from all different ethnicities, and to see that they actually could participate and be fully involved and that they belonged. And then we did the same thing on the accessibility side by making sure that it was accessible. We had something called Toledo is for everyone. And in Toledo is for everyone. We had a guide that was in large print for people that might not be able to read the smaller print. We had maps for those who were using scooters to move around the golf course. We had a sensory friendly vehicle for anybody that was in sensory overload and needed an air conditioned place to take a break. So we really did try to have everyone feel that they had a part and that they were included and that they belonged. I didn't want anybody to wake up on Tuesday morning after the Solheim and say, oh my gosh, why didn't I go? Or why didn't I know about it? And it was really important that we make everyone aware of it and know that they they fit, they belonged, and they were welcome to participate in whatever way they could. I can say from personal experience and joining you with these golf clinics that you, you, you're you living that, you're you're walking the talk, and that you're trying your best to make sure that the game of golf is accessible. And seeing that individuals who may have said, I'm too old to learn how to play golf, or I had a bad experience on the golf course, and I either got teased or I didn't feel like I could hold my own. I've had individuals say, I just want to drive the golf cart. I don't want it. I don't want to even try. <laughs> you know what I'm saying? It is a fun part of the game. <laughs> <laughs> I like driving the golf cart too. But it's not the main reason. We hope that they, you know, individuals join a scramble. We, we want you to participate and be part of that. You know, because you are a leader... And I don't know if you see yourself that way, but you should. As a leader in this space, encouraging others, motivating them, inspiring them to try, you know, talk about the qualities you look for when you're mentoring somebody else, either in the game of golf or on some of these boards. Well, I think the key is to meet people where they are. You know, when it comes to golf, I really can play and love to play with anyone. And I'm excited when somebody wants to put their toe in the water and learn the game and not be left out. You know, kind of the same advice I got early on, I'm still giving to people. And, you know, golf hasn't only been an important part of my professional life, but my husband and I play golf together. My family and I play golf together. And so I've met people professionally and personally through the game, and I want other people to have that same opportunity. So the clinics really create this very safe space for you to ask any question. What's in the golf bag? What does this club mean? What is the scoring system? How do we keep track, you know, all of those kinds of questions that you might be afraid to ask in any other environment are all safe and on the table. And then making sure that people are encouraged and have fun with the game. Yes. Uh, Because it can be very frustrating. And if you're an athlete, you're going to go out there and you think you're going to be good from the get go and you're just not. It's a hard game to learn, but it can just be a complete joy and a pleasure. You get to be outside. It's good for you physically. You have to concentrate. So I think it's good for you mentally to get away from all of the stress and all of the things that you're faced with in either your personal or professional life. It does take a lot of time. You know, part of the reason people don't do it is because they're like, oh my gosh, I have to give up, you know, four hours. But you can go play nine and two, have a really good time and have a, an opportunity to be outside and, and to move physically. So I really think it's it's also good for you, both physically and mentally. Mm-hmm. I've seen individuals that play and it's it's really not an age get cap on this. No, not at all. It's a lifetime sport. I hope to be playing as long as I can stand <laughs> up. <laughs> I can definitely see that. I also see you, if you even can't stand up, I see you being propped up and still swinging. That is possible. (laughs) That's what's great about golf, right? Yes, it is. Very accessible. Talk about the conversations because that whole in one idea that you had, and I remember conversations that you talked about empowering and your desire to empower others for dialogue. You have a women's leadership summit that 
came out of some of the work that you did with the LPGA. Is that correct? Yes. So I was on the big committee that presented Toledo and Inverness as a place for the 2021 Solheim Cup. And as part of that bid committee and building the strategy and our story and our presentation, I kept saying it's really important for women to be front and center that week. It's a women's golf tournament. It's the single biggest women's golf event. We compared it to kind of an Olympic experience because people are rooting for their teams and rooting for their countries. So I really felt like it was important that women be front and center. So that's when we came up with the idea to have a women's summit during Solheim Cup week. And Judd Silverman was also on the bid committee and he said, why don't we start now and test the waters with a women's summit in conjunction with with what's now known as the Dana Open. It was the Marathon Classic at the time. We created our first one as part of the Marathon Classic on the golf course with about 250 women. Amy Robach was our original, our our initial first inaugural, I guess, speaker. And we just hit a home run. We have a really important vision, which is that it's a day of development. So we want women to invest in their personal and professional development. We think we change lives by women's participation in the summit. And then at the same time, we are giving back to the community and donating over a million dollars since we started to the children's charities that are benefit benefits of the, the golf tournament. That's amazing that you've able to tie in. I have been blessed enough to attend and gotten a enriched experience each time. And so really hats off to you for that that wonderful experience, at least I know I had. The speakers, the engagement, uh, the involvement, the fun lots of fun. And then there's this promotion of riders. You know, you really have built in this holistic look at the experience of coming to a summit. And so I've noticed these different components. And at the end, the cherry on top is the fact that monies are donated to those nonprofits that can help um, really way beyond the day right? throughout the year. So, you know, really kudos to you and the whole committee for that work. I know it's a lot of work. And the committee is an important thing to talk about as well. When we had the idea, I literally sent an email to about 20 or 25 women, former colleagues, women leaders in the community, and said, we have this idea. And if you think it's a good idea and you'd like to be a part of it, can you come to this meeting at you know four o'clock on a Thursday? Everybody showed up and we had just an amazing dialogue. We built out kind of our outcomes for the first one. Most of those women are still involved and we've folded in new people along the way. We've evolved over time. Now we have 800 women at the Glass City Center. We come back to the tournament, which is next week, with an experience on the golf course so that we can engage with some LPGA players. We're going to celebrate the 40 years of the tournament. So we'll be looking at, yeah, we'll be looking at, you know, clothes (laughs) from 40 years ago and equipment from 40 years ago so that we stay connected and keep the women thinking about the golf course and the golf tournament. And also we need to show up for these women players, you know, if not us, who, I mean, these are women that are trying to make a life out of golf and chasing their dreams. And by showing up at this golf tournament, we're making those dreams possible. And so we're really excited and committed to bringing women back to the golf course to be there to support the players that are going to be here. Then you have this golf clinic that we're also promoting to try to make sure it doesn't have to stop with the golf tournament. If you really are excited about golf, or at least want to try, then try to get into a golf clinic that can that's very easy, really down to earth with people who are very welcoming in the game. Exactly. And I think that we're trying to create through the clinic some cohorts, right, of women who want to play together and are at similar levels. So there's no embarrassment about not being as good as somebody else and just coming out and having fun and enjoying the camaraderie and the opportunity to be outside and and really enjoy the game. Now, and I will say this, I've experienced that the cohorts, they go off and they go to these scrambles and they're starting to do business on the golf course. Yeah, exactly. You know, how, how exciting is that? Yeah, I have two, two people who are serving on the community foundation staff who have not been able to participate in those many scrambles for the different organizations that they support. And they're now able to participate, which is fantastic. So they're building relationships with donors. They're 
making sure that the Greater Toledo Community Foundation is present and visible at these important outings that are benefiting, you know, really great organizations in our community. And there's many stories of people who have said, okay, I'm finally comfortable. I'll, I'll actually do, you know, the scramble for this benefit or for this work experience. And I never really felt the confidence to do that before. Mm -hmm. Yes. It doesn't matter what the title is behind the individual's name or in front of their name. It's truly, we've had presidents and VPs and directors and those, and we've had stay at home moms across the board. And then those that are coming in, they're just never tried, or they were discouraged at one point and they're trying to learn. So I'm, I'm excited about the next session. I know we do fall. Um, so that will be information will be following, uh, concerning that, but the, you know, not only the clinic, but the leadership summit, I think you, you come up with bigger and better ideas every time. I'm not even sure how you do that. Can you talk about your process? Because you're a strategic planner. I know that in your firm, mm -hmm. very similar to my firm, um, strategic planning is critically important. Can you talk about your planning process and how you encourage others to think about the planning? Can you talk to that? For the first several years, it was really event to event. So what's our theme going to be this year based on sort of what we thought was most relevant for the times we were in? And then when the Solheim Cup Women's Summit was such a huge success, you know, where we really increased the participation, did a visioning session and set the vision for the Women's Leadership Summit, not just for a specific one, but like, who are we as a leadership team? And who are we as an a summit, like what is it that we want to accomplish? Use the Simon Sinek, you know, a strategy around first you have to know why you do what you do before you get into how and what you do. And so our why is very much around engaging these powerful and amazing women as a steering team in empowering women in their personal and professional journey while making athletics visible, albeit golf, and giving back to the community. And then we now also still tie in what do we think is most relevant so we have our very first meeting we talk about what are the critical topics we use a survey from the previous year where we ask for ideas of the participants speakers themes etc and we kind of do a tandem theme and speaker so we start getting our theme figured out and then we look to see what speakers might match that theme and we interview them. And then when we find the match, then we go to print on, you know, our theme this year was own your voice, be heard, be bold, be you. And then our speakers were really tailored around that theme and hope, hopefully, you know, accomplishing that outcome. Um, there's a lesson there too for leaders that are listening. Again, it's very intentional. Nothing is happenstance when you're doing an event. And when it, it's very obvious that you have been very strategic in development of it, as well as rolling it out and promoting it. So really kudos to you on the committee. Thank you. Yeah, everything is intentional from what we serve, what we teach, what we give back. This year, probably the best ever of really supporting local. So we had a local keynote. We had our local authors featuring their books. We had a local designer do our gift bag. We had a local bakery produce our dessert. So in addition now to the difference we're making with the nonprofits, we're also making an economic impact for these women-owned businesses and enterprises who are trying, again, to make a livelihood in our community. So we're lifting up the community in, in many ways. Thank you so much. I, I can't thank you enough for coming on the show and kind of sharing, again, how these major impactful events take place and what it takes to, you know, to do one well. So thank you so much for coming on. Thank you for having me. Excellent. So anyone listening, don't forget, if you have any information that you'd like to share about the show or suggestions, you can write into us at info at mazeassociatesltd.com. And of course, please make sure you like, share, and subscribe. So until next time. The Pen Leader Podcast is hosted by Dr. Shan DeGore and brought to you by Mace & Associates LTD, creating customized solutions for growth in the areas of leadership development, strategic planning, and culture building. Find out more at www.maceassociatesltd.com. Don't forget to subscribe to the Pen Leader Podcast and share with others.